I would say my life is pretty average. My name is Tristan, and I live in the more rural side of Texas in a small town of no more than 1 in 500 people. My wife Gabby and I wanted to have children eventually, but we were both still young and didn't want to make such a commitment. So we did what most people did in this situation. We decided to get a dog. What could go wrong right? So that day we began browsing Craigslist looking for dog adoption ads. Most of them were way out of our price range and we almost gave up looking. Then we saw it. The ad for a boxer named Butch. Butch was brown with white spots down his chest. What was off about this ad was that not only was it cheaper than the other ads, it was only $10. I don't know if you've ever tried adopting a dog online before, but this number is unheard of. Do you think this is the one? Gabby asked. It's the only one we can afford. Plus, even if it was fake, it won't hurt to call the guy. I replied. So I dialed the number into my phone and it started ringing. A man answered after the first ring, only a few seconds after calling. Weird. And breathed into the phone for about five seconds before saying, Hello, in a raspy voice. They were either a heavy smoker or had some sort of condition. Hi, my name is Tristan and I was interested in your Craigslist ad. Is it still available? There was about a five second silence and I almost considered he didn't hear me before he finally responded. Meet me at this address in two hours. 114 Clover LN, Texas. Then he hung up. That wasn't really a yes or no, but I said F it, I'll go anyway. I felt a connection with this dog the longer stared at the ad, if that makes any sense to you. So we GPS the address, and it is about 50 miles out. Pretty long drive, but I could make it in time for this guy's two-hour mark. For whatever reason, he could only meet at 2 p.m. on a Saturday afternoon was beyond me. We began our long drive, and it was a surprisingly cloudy day with the clouds looking like they are about to pour rain. It was odd because rain wasn't common in this area at all. It rained maybe once a month. As we neared the location of the guy's house, we noticed how creepy the area was. Every house around here was either rusted all over or completely collapsed. I didn't see anybody around these houses for the five minutes we drove through the streets of this neighborhood. Then at the end of the road was our destination. When I say end of the road, it was literally the end. I mean dead end. His house was the only one at the end of the street, and it too was rusted to the core. There were also no windows on this particular house. That was odd, but I didn't think anything of it. We wasted no time and got out to begin walking to the door. The smell was the first thing I noticed. It was horrible like rancid meat left in the sun all day. I couldn't tell where it was coming from, but it got stronger as we neared the front door. Maybe this wasn't such a good idea. Gabby spoke with a hint of fear in her voice. We've already come this far. I sighed as I knocked twice on the door. There was no answer so I knocked again, this time much more louder. I heard footsteps inside the house and then saw an eye glare through the broken curtains. The man opened the door and greeted us with a condescending look. What do you want? He croaked angrily. So, we're here for the dog. I replied confused. We had just spoken an hour ago. The man's face turned from angry to relieved as he motioned for us to come inside. I began to follow, but Gabby quickly grabbed my arm and gave me the are you serious look. I told her to relax and continued inside. I noticed lots of paintings hanging on the rusty walls that lined the interior of his house. What was weird is that all of them were human bodies with dogs as heads, with all the humans wearing tuxedos as if it were an old photo shoot. He then took me to a room with a big steel crate in the middle with holes drilled into the side for air holes. The man then gestured his hand to the crate and told me to open it. It was at this point I was starting to get freaked out, but I had to man up and open it. I unlocked the gate at the top of the crate and slowly raised the lid to reveal the dog. Butch then looked up at me from his laying positioned inside the box. Hey little guy, wanna come home with me? I whispered. Butch's ears perked up, but he didn't move. I looked at the man and told him we would take him. The man then began to smile mischievously and told me to go ahead and take him out of the box. Um, alright. I then reached down inside the box to try to pick up Butch. I had just managed to get my arms around him when he snarled viciously and bit me. 
He bit me hard too, I was bleeding. I dropped him and jumped back away from the box. Gabby gasped as she saw the bite marks on my arm. I clenched the wound and looked at the crate in disgust, then to the man. This whole situation is getting weird, we should go. I growled. You already said you would take him. The man said more aggressively this time while stepping forward toward the crate. I saw Gabby flinch through the corner of my eyes. If you don't, I'll just kill him. This is when it hit me. This dog just had an abusive owner and that's why he bit me. I don't know what it was about me but animals were my passion. If I could save an animal I would. No matter what the circumstances are I am going to get this dog out of here. The man noticed my hesitation and angrily stepped toward the crate. Make your decision or I will. He demanded. Well take him. I snapped back. Just help me get him into my car. The man nodded as he handed me a leash and lifted the dog from the crate no problem. What a dick. He knew it was going to bite me. He then placed him in my back seat and I paid him his ten dollars. I quickly got into my car and started the engine. The man walked toward the window which was down and leaned toward me. A smile grew across his face as he said those words. The words I will never forget. Thank you for finally freeing me from this curse. It's your problem now. I glared back at him and rolled up my window. What the F is this guy's problem talking about this dog like that? I drove off angrily and took one last glance at the man standing on the middle of the pavement through my review mirror. For a split second I saw a shadow hovering over him, as if looking down on him. I blinked and it was gone, as if it were never there. It must have been my imagination because of the creepy vibes this guy was giving out. I didn't think anything of it. Then off we went to show Butch his new home. I was actually pretty relieved now that we had left. I could finally get home and bond with this dog like I've always wanted to. The drive was surprisingly smooth as Butch was asleep for most of it. I knew this because I could hear him snoring the entire time. The blood from the bite mark was beginning to dry out. We pulled up to the house and I saw Gabby smile. I could tell she was happy that we finally got a dog, even though that was the most sketchy exchange I've ever experienced in my life. I carefully placed the lease around Butch's neck didn't bite me thank God, and stood outside the car gently tugging on it to get him inside. Surprisingly, he hopped out of the back seat and went straight to the front door. Good boy, I praised, opening the door to let him inside. He walked in curiously and sniffed around, getting to know the environment a little better. Butch then walked over to the couch and jumped on it. No bad dog, get down, I commanded as I tried to grab him. Butch then snapped at me, barely missing my arm, and glared at me in hatred. I need to be more careful next time, this dog obviously doesn't like me yet. I said F it and let him lay on the couch. What harm could he do? It was getting pretty late in the day and I had to get up early for work the next morning so I called it a night. Me and Gabby lay down and Butch decided to lay on the floor at the foot of our bed. Fine by me as long as he isn't in the bed. I dozed off within a few minutes and I wasn't sure how long I was out. I was in a deep sleep when I was woken up to a sound coming from the kitchen. It sounded like a pan crashing on the tile floor. I shot up and got to my feet. Gabby was still sound asleep for she was an extremely heavy sleeper. I grabbed a bat from the closet and walked around the bed toward the door. It was then that I noticed that Butch wasn't where he was when I went to sleep. That's odd because we always sleep with the door closed so there is no way he could have gotten out. I looked around the room to see if he had just moved somewhere, but Butch was nowhere to be seen. F. I slowly opened the door to the hallway and peeked around the corner. Nothing in the hallway, although it was ridiculously dark. I went back to my room to grab my phone from the end table and turn the flashlight on. The hallway looked even creepier with the beam of light coming from my phone. I made my way to the kitchen to see that nothing was out of place. It was as if nobody had even been here. I could have sworn I heard something unless I was dreaming it, but that still doesn't explain why Butch was out of our room. I glanced at the clock on the microwave. It was already 3.02 am. I then made my way to the living room to see if I could find anything. As I walked into the room a scent hit my nose. It smelled of rotting meat and made me gag. 
I put my shirt over my face to keep the smell out and continued into the room. It was then that I noticed something small and dark on the couch. I crept closer to see what it was, and I nearly threw up. It was a dead cat. I don't even own a cat. How the hell did this thing get in here? I then heard growling from behind me. I turned around quickly to see what the noise was coming from. Then I saw it. In the far corner of the room, Butch was standing up facing toward the corner with a deep growl coming from his throat. What the F is going on? Butch, I snapped angrily. What the hell are you doing out here? His growling stopped, but Butch continued to stare into the corner. It was giving me the chills. As much as I didn't want to, I began walking toward Butch. I've seen this type of shit in horror movies before, and it never ends well. I was about five feet away from Butch at this point before stopping again. Butch! I yelled much louder this time. Answer me. This is when shit got creepy. Butch turned his head slowly toward me and I got a glance at his eyes. They looked like pure evil. There is no other way to describe it. His eyes were red and his mouth even looked like he was giving me a crooked smile. I then noticed blood dropping from his teeth. He began to growl again, this time much deeper. Butch didn't break eye contact with me as he turned to face me completely, the growling getting louder. As if things weren't already bad enough, the lamp next to the couch fell over, shattering into pieces on the floor. What the actual F is going on? Then Butch leaped at me before I could react, causing me to drop my bat and phone. With a surprising amount of force he pinned me down and began snapping at my throat. I held his neck to prevent him from reaching me, but he was incredibly strong for a dog. It took all my strength, but I managed to throw him off of me and I made for my bat. As soon as I grabbed it, the lights flickered on. I didn't care for I was focused on Butch, preparing myself for a second attack. But Butch was nowhere to be seen. What in God's name is going on? I heard Gabby scream as I turned and saw her in the doorway to the living room. She must have been the one who turned on the lights. It must have looked pretty damn weird now that I think about it. Here I am almost naked in my boxers holding a bat covered in blood with a broken lamp on the floor and dead cat on the couch. It was Butch. I managed to say through my gasping for breath. I don't know what the hell got into him, but he went psycho. I could tell she was shocked as she stared at me in disbelief. We stood there in silence as we both realized something. Where was Butch? I rushed to our room to see if he was somehow back in his spot. I slammed the door open and gasped as I saw not Butch laying in the spot in front of our bed, but a pool of blood. Part 2. We stood there in silence as we both realized something. Where was Butch? I rushed to our room to see if he was somehow back in his spot. I slammed the door open and gasped as I saw not Butch laying in the spot in front of our bed, but a pool of blood. My wife screamed as she too saw the pool of blood. I grabbed her to try to calm her down, but she shook me off and ran to the kitchen. I followed her there and saw that she had grabbed the phone and proceeded to dial 911. Please, help our dog. He's gone. There is blood everywhere, she cried into the phone. I could hear the 911 operator trying to comfort her, but my wife wasn't hearing it. I would have preferred not to get the police involved, but it was already too late for that. While Gabby was handling that, I decided to go check out the pool of blood laying in our bedroom. I walked in and noticed that the blood had began to smell awful after sitting there for so long. I pulled my shirt over my face and proceeded to investigate, kneeling down in front of the blood to look closer. I could tell it was really thick, but that still gave no explanation for how it got there. I grabbed an old shirt from the drawer next to me and laid it down in the blood. Instantly, the blood began to sizzle, and some of it splattered on my hand. I quickly jumped up and ran to the bathroom to wash it off. My hand grew numb as I washed away the blood, and I couldn't feel anything where the blood had been moments before. I stared to panic as I ran to the kitchen to tell Gabby. She had just hung up the phone and turned to me as I walked in. So I explained to them what happened, and they will be here soon. She sighed. What's wrong with your hand? I realized I was holding my numb hand tightly against my chest. Gabby looked like she had just calmed down and I didn't want to worry her so I just told her it was nothing. The cops arrived 15 minutes later 
and two of them began interrogating me while two more searched the house. I told them everything from the creepy guy on Craigslist to the dead cat to the pool of blood. I could tell they didn't believe me completely, but what else could I have done? I mean shit the dead cat is laying on the couch right now, and it's not like I put it there for decoration. The cops offered to put us in a hotel for the rest of the night while they continued their investigation and we happily accepted. I couldn't sleep too much that night for I was still scared shitless by the whole situation. I woke up early the next morning and headed to work, exhausted. Fortunately, I could feel my hand again. I work in a hardware store as a sales floor associate, so I talked to a lot of people on a daily basis and needed to be at the top of my game. I poured myself the biggest cup of coffee I could and chugged it. I usually don't drink coffee, but I can make an exception after the shit that went down last night. The day went on as usual. I helped customers, sold barbecue pits, finished up the invoices, that kind of stuff. I even managed to forget about the whole butch situation for a while. When my shift was finally over, I called Gabby to see where she was because I was almost positive she wouldn't dare go home without me. She was at the gym so I stopped there to pick her up before heading home. I began to sweat nervously as we pulled into the driveway to our home. The house looked darker than I remember, but I blamed that on the lack of sleep. We got out of the car and began walking toward the front door. I glanced at the window on the left side of our house and noticed a figure standing there. It looked like the outline of a man, but the sunlight reflected off the window making it hard to tell. I shook my head trying to clear it. I must be losing my mind if I'm seeing people standing inside my house through windows. Gabby unlocked the door and opened it. We both peered inside and noticed nothing out of the ordinary. I walked to the window where I saw the shadow, but nobody was there. I then checked the living room to see what I could find. Nothing there either. Even the dead cat was gone. The cops must have cleaned it up for us or took it for evidence. The lamp was still shattered into pieces next to the couch, but other than that everything was fine. We then made our way to our bedroom. I was shaking as I opened the door to look inside. Surprisingly, the cops had cleaned up the pool of blood as well and everything was fine in here. Thank God. I heard Gabby sigh in relief next to me. Everything is back to normal. I wish she would have been right. I cleaned up the broken lamp and we both sat down to watch TV for a while. I was careful not to sit in the spot where a dead cat was just 12 hours before. I was happy to find that TV had taken my mind off the fact that I was fighting for my life in this exact room the night before. Eventually we both grew tired and due to lack of sleep I was ready to hit the hay. We lay down in our bed and I instantly fell asleep out of pure exhaustion. I was deep into my sleep when I heard the last sound I ever wanted to hear. Growling. At first I figured I was just having some kind of nightmare and I just tried to think of something else. But then the growling got louder. My eyes snapped open and standing over me, staring into my soul, was none other than Butch himself. Now I'm not usually one to scream, but this scared the actual shit out of me and I could not keep it in. I launched myself off the bed just in time to avoid Butch's jaws making contact with my throat. I heard him slam into the wall and start running. I got myself together and chased him. To my horror, he hurled himself through the window into our backyard and scurried off into the darkness. Shattered glass littered both inside the window and outside. I stood there in disbelief at what had just happened. I heard a scream behind me and turned to see Gabby with a look of pure horror on her face as she stared at the wall next to the window Butch had just jumped through. I followed her gaze to see what had frightened her and what I saw left me in intense fear. On the wall, scratched in blood, was my name. This is when I started to panic. Whatever this thing was, it wants to kill me, that I am sure of. Now that I was in fear for my life, I wasn't hesitant to call the cops this time. They arrived shortly after and began the whole process again. I explained what happened, they searched the house and Gabby was loosing her shit. This time, not only did the police offer to put us in a hotel for the night, they strongly recommended it. They didn't have to ask me twice and I practically jumped at the offer. The deputy even personally drove us to the hotel himself this time to make sure we were safe. It was about 4 a.m. by the time we ended up at the hotel 
and I was incredibly tired after not having any sleep these last few days. I passed out immediately and had to wake up just a few hours later for work. I woke up feeling sick and made my way to the bathroom just in case I couldn't hold it in. Sure enough, I collapsed in front of the toilet and proceeded to vomit. Are you okay? Gabby stormed in sounding alarmed. Yeah, I'm fine. I think I'm just getting sick. I replied in a tired voice. There was no way I was going to work like this, so I had no choice but to call in sick. I hate doing that, but I'm sure they would be okay without me for one day. We still weren't going back to the house, so we agreed to stay at the hotel for a while longer. It was nice to be away from everything for a while. I got to catch up on some sleep and not having to worry about being killed by a demonic dog every time I closed my eyes was relieving. The deputy called with no good news. He just said that they couldn't find any trace of Butch and that the blood on the wall did not belong to a human, but he did assure us that the house was safe. Great. Eventually the maid came by and told us we had to leave, so we packed our things and went back home. I was hesitant to even get out of the car when we pulled up to the driveway, but we might as well get it over with. We both got out and walked to the front door. I'm not sure if it is because of what has been going on lately, but every time I look at this house it feels like it gets more evil. I put the key in and hesitated before turning it. What lies inside for me today? I turned the knob and opened the door. Gabby and I began searching the house again looking for things out of place. Nothing was out of place in the living room as well as the kitchen. We then approached our bedroom door. I was literally too scared to open the door so Gabby had to do it. I heard her sigh in relief as I too noticed that the blood was gone. We walked inside to take a closer look and I noticed that if you looked at the wall at the right angle you could still see where the scratches used to be. There is nothing we can do about that except maybe put a coat of paint on it. But that was a project for another day. I felt like shit and just needed to rest. Gabby and I both laid down in our bed, but sleeping was the last thing I was going to do. It wasn't nighttime yet, it was actually only 5.30 p.m., so I probably could have taken a nap, but I was too scared to do so. Eventually, I got bored of just laying there and decided to go to the kitchen to make something to eat. While I was making myself a sandwich, something occurred to me. What was I going to do tonight? I was almost positive Butch would come back and how was I going to deal with it. We didn't have enough money to afford a hotel for the night, and we didn't really have any friends in the area that we could stay with. I thought harder and then I decided. I would go back to the man I bought Butch from and get some answers. Going back to that creepy ass house was the last thing I wanted to do, but I felt like it was the only option. Then I recalled those last words he had told me. Thank you for finally freeing me from this curse. It's your problem now. Was being attacked every night by a demonic dog what he meant by this curse? I'd managed to survive this long, but it's only a matter of time before Butch got the upper hand. I had to act now. I grabbed my keys and began to walk outside, but then stopped as I realized Gabby was still in bed. I can't just leave her here. I know Butch is after me, but I'm not going to risk losing her. I woke her up and quickly rushed us into the car. I could tell she wasn't pleased with going back to that place, but we had no other choice. I was going to get answers. We began our drive back to that godforsaken place, and I could see the sun was beginning to set. At this rate, it would be dark by the time we drove home. After an hour of driving, we finally arrived at the man's house, and it was starting to get dark. We wouldn't be able to see outside about ten minutes from now. Gabby was begging me to turn around, but I was not about to just go back home and get attacked by Butch again. We got out and stormed to the front door of the rusty old house. I then began banging on the front door hard to make sure the man would hear it. No answer. I know you're in there, you bastard, I roared as kicked the door. To my surprise, the door flew open after I kicked it, revealing darkness. Let's just go home. Nobody is here. I heard Gabby whisper behind me. I could tell she was petrified. I was not about to turn around, so I pulled out my phone and turned on the flashlight. The house looked much less cleaner than before if what I saw last time was considered clean. The pictures of the human dog things were scattered around the floor with the frames broken or completely gone. 
The couch to the left of the room had been flipped over and the bottom torn out. It looked as if a tornado blew through this house. I carefully made my way to the back room where I met Butch and sure enough the crate was still there, but it was closed. I slowly walked toward it, ready to open it when Gabby grabbed my arm. No, this is insane. We need to leave before something happens, she cried. I shook her off and proceeded to open the crate. The lid seemed heavier than before, but I managed to open it and what I saw inside horrified me. Laying there, naked, dead, was the man who sold me Butch. Part 3. I froze. It was over. Butch was going to kill me and there was nothing I could do about it. With that man dead, I had no way of knowing Butch's past or how to stop him from harassing me every time I closed my eyes. We should leave. Gabby whispered behind me, petrified in fear. I nodded and we both left the old house. I thought about calling the cops and reporting the dead body, but we would probably look guilty so I decided against it. We hurried outside and made our way back to the car. It was pitch black and I almost couldn't find it. We both sat in silence on the drive home and it gave me time to think about my options. I could go home and act like nothing happened or I could act. The idea of sitting around waiting for Butch to come back didn't appeal to me, so I decided on getting a gun. I really didn't want it to come to this, but I had no choice. And even then, I don't know what good a gun would do against a satanic dog. As we made our way closer to town, I turned into the parking lot of a gun shop. I live in Texas. Yes, that is a thing, and told Gabby to wait in the car while I went inside. As I neared the door, I noticed someone glaring at me through the metal bars in the window. When he saw me glance at him, he quickly moved out of view. I had a bad feeling about this. I walked inside and was surprised at how old-fashioned everything was. The counters were oak wood, with countless guns on every wall of the room. Pretty much what you'd expect in a gun store. There was a redneck man behind the counter eyeing me suspiciously as I walked in. When I say redneck, I don't mean it as an insult. It was the only way to describe him. He was wearing a ragged gray sleeveless shirt, blue jean shorts, and I can't make this up. He literally had a piece of straw dangling from his lips. What can I do you for? He greeted, with a voice matching the style of his clothes. I nervously walked to the counter and began looking at all the firearms on the wall behind him. I'm looking to buy a gun. I replied, well, no shit, Sherlock. Why else would you be at my gun shop? The man behind the counter laughed, slapping his knee. You looking to protect yourself or do some killing? I glanced up at him. For all he knew, I just wanted to go hunting. Why would he think otherwise? A guy like you coming in here all sweatin'? I seen that look before. You tired of running and want to put a bullet in someone's head? He laughed. Well, you came to the right place. Ever shot a gun before? I shook my head silence. I didn't want to look guilty, but he was on to me. So which one should I get? I said nervously. The guy smiled. If it's protection you're looking for, I got the thing for it. The guy then pulled a pistol from under the counter. This here will get the job done. It was smaller than I expected, but I wasn't picky. I needed a gun tonight, and I wasn't walking away without one. I'll take it. I decided, reaching for my wallet. How much do I owe you? That'll be three hundred dollars. He affirmed. Shit. I sighed. You got anything cheaper? I'm a little tight on money. The guy studied my face for a few seconds and sighed. All right, how about two hundred dollars? The guy added. I don't usually do this, but I ain't ever seen fear like that in anybody else. I realized that I was sweating and got a glance at myself through a mirror on one of the walls. I was pale white. I didn't have any other option and two hundred dollars sounded fair, so I accepted. I gave him the money, grabbed the pistol, and began walking towards the door. Once you go down that path, there's no turning back. The guy warned. You don't know what you're capable of until you're looking down the sights of a gun at another man. I glanced at him one last time before leaving to see him smile back at me mischievously. I heard back to the car open the driver's door. Gabby glanced nervously at the gun in my hand and looked away. I hopped back into the car and drove home. I was shaking at the thought that I might have to actually use that gun tonight. I loved animals and would never want to hurt them, 
but if it was between me or Butch, I have no choice. We pulled up to the house and got out of the car. The house now looked like pure evil from the outside, especially with the glow of the street lamp nearby. We made our way inside and noticed nothing out of place, as if something should have been anyway. It was about 9 p.m., so we had a few hours to kill. Gabby and I laid down on the couch to watch TV for a few hours before it was about time for bed. I placed the gun in the end table on my side of the bed in our bedroom before going back to the living room to lay with Gabby. I noticed it was getting late after a while and nudged Gabby to let her know what time it was, but she didn't respond, just stared ahead at nothing. Gabby, I said, nudging her one more time. No response. Gabby, this time I yelled louder and it finally got her attention. She looked at me as if she had just woken up but her eyes had never closed. Sorry, she whispered. It's just that I heard the bells ringing. What bells? What are you talking about, Gabby? I replied curiously. She looked up at me with gray, tired eyes. I don't know, she said. I'm probably just tired. She then got up and headed to the bedroom. Something was off. But I didn't know what it was so I just followed her. Once I got to the bedroom, I checked the end table drawer to see if the gun was still there. I sighed in relief as I saw the dark pistol laying there. I really didn't want to see Butch tonight. I just want this to be over. But something told me I haven't seen the last of Butch. Not yet, at least. I laid down in bed with Gabby and held her close. I felt safer when she was here. I don't know what I would do if she wasn't. There would be no way I could handle this butch situation alone. I tried to stay awake as long as I could, but eventually the darkness took over and I fell asleep. Then it happened. A loud crash from the kitchen made me jolt awake. I shot up from the bed and looked around the room. Gabby was still asleep and nothing else stood out to me. Another crash from the kitchen made me jump. I opened the end table drawer and grabbed the pistol. I really didn't want to use this, but I was going to end it here and now. I cautiously walked into the hallway and peeked around the corner. Moonlight coming in through the windows allowed me to see my way as I crept toward the kitchen. I turned into the kitchen to see a glass bowl shattered in the middle of the floor. I glanced around the room to see if I could find anything else, but there was nothing. I then made my way to the living room and that's when I saw him. Butch stood there in the middle of the room glaring at me with his red eyes. His fangs were showing, and he looked as if he wanted to tear me apart. I pointed my gun in his direction. Don't make me do this, Butch. I whispered. All I wanted was a dog. My hands were shaking, and I could see the look in Butch's eyes get deeper. He then lowered his body as if ready to pounce. Please, Butch, no. I whispered again with tears beginning to form. Then, to my horror, Butch hurled his body at me. I quickly closed my eyes and pulled the trigger. A deafening roar filled my ears, and it was so painful that I dropped to my knees. I opened one eye to see what had happened, but Butch was nowhere in sight. F did he get away again. My thoughts were interrupted as I heard Gabby scream from our bedroom. I sprinted toward our room in fear as to what I might find there. I got to the door and furiously tried to open it, but it was locked. I could hear Gabby scream again from inside. Gabby! I roared as I began kicking the door with full force. The door gave way and flew open. I fell to my knees at what I saw inside and tears flooded from my face. Standing over Gabby's lifeless body was Butch. He gave me an evil smile and began howling at the top of his lungs. You bastard! I roared as I furiously opened fire in his direction. Anger flowed through my veins and every tear I shed was no longer in sadness, but fury. I stopped shooting and stood up. Butch now lay dead on top of Gabby. I ran over and threw him off of her. I could see the emptiness in Gabby's lifeless eyes as I cried. Gabby, no please. You can't be dead. You're all I have, I sobbed. But I knew it was too late. Butch had won. He had beaten me in the worst way possible. Not with my life, but with the one closest to me. So you don't realize how much you love someone until they are laying in your arms no longer breathing. Butch hadn't just killed Gabby, he had torn me apart from the inside. I stood up and wiped the tears from my eyes. I heard police sirens in the distance. 
One of my neighbors must have called the cops after they heard the gunshots. I accepted my fate as I made my way to the door. I stopped as I passed over Butch to give him one last look. He lay there motionless. The creature of my nightmares had finally been defeated at the price of my wife. I took a deep breath and continued to make my way outside. I walked through the front door to see three police cars pull onto my front lawn. One of the policemen quickly ran toward me and demanded that I drop my weapon. I looked down at my hands and realized I was still holding the pistol. I looked back at the police officer to see him pointing his own gun at me. Drop your weapon now or I'll have no choice but to shoot, the officer yelled. I quickly dropped the gun and put my hands above my head. Three more policemen surrounded me and forced me to the ground. I was so torn after what happened to Gabby that I didn't object. I turned my head to see two police officers storming my house. God only knows what they will think when they see my room. I felt handcuffs tighten around my hands as one of the officers led me to the squad car. He opened the back door and motioned for me to get in. I obeyed and fell into the back seat. He closed the door behind me. I could see the two officers come back out of the house and talk to the other policemen. One glanced at me as he heard what the other one had to say and another policeman began talking on his radio. Next thing I knew I was in an empty room with windows in either side. I must have blacked out. I looked around and instantly realized where I was. I've seen enough movies to recognize an interrogation room when I see one. The door opened and a police officer stepped into the room. He looked at me in disgust and sat down in the chair directly in front of me. He then reached over to the tape recorder laying in the middle of the table and pressed the record button. My name is Officer Nelson. The date is February 22nd, 2014. He then looked up at me. Can you please state your name? He questioned in a heartless tone. I took a deep breath before trying to answer, but no words left my mouth when I opened it. Officer Nelson looked unimpressed by this and sighed. Look, I can't help you unless you help me. Now I'm going to need you to answer my questions, or you could be looking at a long time in prison for what you did to that woman tonight. He growled. I sat there in silence. Not responding to what he was saying, I couldn't move. Inside, my mind was racing. How could he possibly think I killed Gabby? I would never hurt her. It was Butch. Officer Nelson took a deep breath before looking through some papers inside of the envelope laying in front of him. You had an unlicensed gun on you when police arrived. He began. You're already looking at a felony for that, and if you don't talk to me, I'm going to have to assume that what happened tonight in that bedroom was by your hand. Things only escalate from there. I continued to sit in silence. As much as I wanted to object, I wasn't physically able to. Every time I tried to say something, I would freeze up. Officer Nelson then got up from his chair. Things aren't looking good for you. He sighed as he walked out of the room. I wasn't sure how long I sat there before someone else came along, but I didn't care. My life was over now and I didn't really care for living. I was nothing without Gabby. After hours of sitting there in that room, another police officer entered. Sit up, he said quickly. We're transferring you to a cell until your trial. I obeyed and slowly got up to follow him. He led me to a cell down the hall and locked me inside. I turned around to examine my cell. There was a mat on the floor with a toilet in the corner. That was it. At least nobody else was in here with me. I lay down on the uncomfortable mat and closed my eyes. I just wanted to die. Again, I must have blacked out because the next thing I remember was being in a courtroom full of people. I looked around to see a jury and a judge. My lawyer they must have appointed me sat next to me saying something to me, but I couldn't hear him. All I could hear were church bells like Sunday morning when you would get out of church. Suddenly I snapped back into reality. Everyone was looking at me in disgust. Every single person in the jury glared at me. Then the judge stood up. Member of the jury, if you can please give your verdict. He said boldly. A bald guy with a brown jacket in the jury stood up. He cleared his throat before continuing. For one charge of murder and one charge of possession of an unregistered firearm, we find the defendant guilty on all accounts. The judge nodded and he too cleared his throat. 
the defendant shall be sentenced to 35 years to be served at Coastal Bend Detention Center. Even after three years, I still have nightmares about what happened that night. Here I sit in my uncomfortable cell waiting for an early end. I've almost forgotten my name since then for they refer to me only as inmate 54E here. I didn't want to write this, but I figured it wouldn't hurt to finally get it off my chest. There's nothing else to do in this shithole I call home. I hope one day I'll be able to find peace with what happened, but for now I'm living day to day learning to find joy in little things like taking a shower or eating food. I know it probably sounds dumb, but when you're confined to a cage like I am, you learn to do that. I try not to think about Butch and what he did to me. He had ruined my life and my family. I am nothing now. It was time. I looked up at the noose I had just tied with some rope I managed to steal from one of the storage rooms. Maybe I could finally find peace somewhere, far away from this life. Maybe I'll even see Gabby there. Yay, I'd like that. I can hear it now. The bells, they are so beautiful. Thanks for listening. If you like our work, do subscribe because your support helps us keep this channel alive.